pleasure to be here, and thanks for listening, although we have a break. So my lab works on developing novel treatments for Parkinson's and other brain disorders by means of mathematics and physics. So what we focus on is self-organization processes. And self-organization, um, here are a few examples. You have large systems, and that there's not a single element that dictates the behavior of the entire system, but it's a beautiful, elegant, and very efficient um, coordination that leads to complex pattern, complex dynamics, and so on. And a classical example of self-organization is synchronization. Synchronization play, plays a huge role in Parkinson's disease. When and then, uh, physiological healthy conditions, different neurons have different tasks, but if all neurons are acting in synchrony, uh, this impairs brain function. I'll show you an example of a Parkinson patient. Typical Parkinson patient, you see this shuffling, the little steps. Patient is on his on mats, yeah. close to his best on. The instruction is just to enter the room and you see how difficult it is for him. There's hardly any facial expression. The arms are not swinging. This was the patient's condition in July 2018. Now, where comes, where does self-organization come into play? What we do is we use maths and physics in order to make networks unlearn their ability to produce abnormal synchrony. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a suppression, mm -hmm. acute suppression, but we change the topology and the connectivity of these networks. And one of the, one of the early um, Observations in Parkinson patients was done by Charcot more than a hundred years ago. When his patients came by, for example, train, um, these vibrations uh, of, of the trains led to a certain improvement of the symptoms. Not basically not tremor, but akinesia and rigidity. And then Charcot um, designed this chair in order to mimic the vibrations of the train. What we do, uh, all of these studies that came out of this, in a way, had in some sense inconclusive effects, more acute effects, not really long-lasting uh, sustained effects, but I think it's, an, it's a relevant and important finding, very important finding. So what we do, and we started with maths and physics, we, under, we um, studied how different, or how the, the connectivity, how the structure of networks impacts on the activity and vice versa, that's very important. So for example, even the simplest networks and the different balls signify different neurons, can be, can be in ver qualitatively very, very different states. For example, they can be strongly connected and strongly synchronized. What you see there is the x-axis, time axis, and it's a raster plot. So all of the neurons, the y-axis shows that the neuron index are firing in synchrony. Or they ca the same neurons can be in a qualitatively very, very different state, loosely connected, physiologically connecting, doing their own information processing jobs, being desynchronized. And the, what we aim at is designing optimal stimulation techniques by means of maths and physics in order to move the networks from one attractor to the other attractor. So the goal is not to suppress firing or abnormal activity, but to change, to make them unlearn their abnormal connectivity so that they unlearn their ability to produce abnormal neural synchrony. And we've done, we've developed this for, for deep brain stimulation, for a new version of deep brain stimulation, but the important point is patients understandably prefer non-invasive treatments. And that's why we started with fingertip stimulation. And why fingertip stimulation? Because fingertip is, fingertips are very uh, small parts of the skin, of course, but strategically favorable parts simply because of the huge, as we know, from the homunculus, a huge cortical representation. And this is why, this is the first prototype we've used. We, we used vibratory stimulation of the fingertips with mathematically optimized stimulation patterns. So it's just brief, non-painful, brief, and typically relaxing types of stimulation patterns. So when this patient then came to us in August 20, 2018, that was the first day 
um, he was not instructed to reduce his medication. He was instructed to use as much as necessary. He took a huge amount of medication, about 25 pills a day, basically every half hour. And this is the patient after two times, two hours, with the vibrotactile coordinated reset glove in the evening. And you see that gait is, of course, um, very different, large steps, the arms are swinging, facial expression came back. This is the patient on the sixth day of the treatment. When he, after three days, he had Stanford when he was an outpatient, um, in the outpatient garden, that's an HC. He went home and used the glove for two hours a day. Remarkably, all of our patients with, for example, olfactory um, impairment of, um, reported an improvement even of olfaction, so not just motor symptom improvement. Patient then did really well. We have a couple of patients we are following up for a couple of years. So for example, this is his first marathon. He was never a runner before in oh, nice. November oh, you did 2018. It, you did it, you did it. And then last year, in, I think October, he was running his first triathlon. So this is more than four years now. And we have a couple of patients that are following up. It's substantial improvement. I think it, it nicely illustrates how important it is if, if, we, if we change activity patterns in the brain in a very well-defined way, this may have huge also metabolic uh, consequences. And I, I think we are just at the beginning of developing very novel types of treatment that may really help patients, not only for Parkinson's, also for essential trauma, dystonia, epilepsy, and, and other disorders. And that's the thank you to my great collaborators. Thank you.